Hello, welcome back to the Cricket Nerds. Today, me and James are going to talk about, well, a little bit around what happened in today's game between India and Bangladesh, in which India pretty comprehensively won. Um, if you want to watch our reaction to that game, then you have to stay tuned for another podcast which is coming up. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, however, we thought it was worth talking about Kohli's century which is called today um, because we reckon it's worth a, a special podcast in its own right, really. Uh, so James, talk to me about this century then. What did you reckon? What were your thoughts? It was, it was very well made. First of all, that, that is the underlying thing. It was a, it was another Coley masterclass. It was really good to see. Um, it was a great tempo. It absolutely took the game away from Bangladesh. Um, not that it was ever really within their grasp, but it, you know, any hope that they did have was absolutely dashed. So from that perspective, it was incredible. Weird ending, some kind of mm. village scenes, I'd say, in that like you could tell he was just he wanted his turn. There was there was single, single vision on I want my I want my century. Um, so some, you know, interesting kind of not taking the singles when he was hitting out to deep mid wicket. Um, the umpires also seemed to want him to have a ton because I think it was the the first ball of the last over. He bowled a leg side wide and the umpire didn't give it. I think he was just he was really keen for Cody to get his century. So uh yeah, that happened. But you know, taking aside the kind of weird stuff that happened at the end, it was masterful. And it kind of brings us on to a, a general question of what makes a really good ODI batter? Because Kohli is potentially the greatest ODI batsman that's ever lived. In in the same way that Look Who's Watching is potentially the greatest cricket nerd subscriber <laughs> that has ever lived. And this is his shout out. If you want to become a member like Look Who's Watching has become, then... Uh, the, the the you can click join it'll be somewhere i don't know where somewhere in the description or just above um join the cricket nerds and you will get a shout out in every single video that we do and do it will be as smooth as that one um yeah. but <laughs> where was i yes awesome odi batsman just in general one thing that i've kind of noticed about Coley, um and i'm sure i'm the first person to ever notice it is that he is incredibly driven on his fitness and it means that he can run the ones and twos all the time which in ODI cricket specifically between overs 10 and 40 ones and twos are where the game is won and lost you know mm. you, you you have to keep that strike rotation high um you have to take the twos when they're there and it, it that that's really well drives the scores you know 300 plus um regularly so I want to get your opinion as well. Um, this isn't just a James monologue, but yeah, <laughs> why is Coley so good? Uh, for sure. Like, I mean, the fitness is a big thing because you've got, I'm not going to name names, but there, there are some big players in the cricket circuit who aren't nearly as fit as Coley. Um, who, when they play 2020s, they can come in and smash it about for 20 overs and they don't have to field very long. And that's okay. Whereas in the one day game, fitness is is so much more important in a lot of ways. I mean, just to field for fifty overs is tiring enough. Um, but to field for fifty overs after batting for the majority of it, that that does take a big level of fitness. And he does run incredibly well throughout um, between the wickets, and and it puts pressure on the fielding side. Um, for me, it's also his ability to play spin so well without looking like getting out. I mean, Coley is renowned for not necessarily going on the attack against spin. He prefers to nerdle it in the gaps and score ones and twos. And what we are frustrated with Coley in the IPL is he kind of does the same thing in 2020 cricket. Whereas in one day cricket, you have that freedom to do that. And so for me in one day cricket, that's where he's best because he's so consistent. Um, but part of that is his ability to pace the innings, right? He'll yeah. attack 
the quicker bowlers. He'll nerdle it around against the spinners, always looking to get ones and twos. And then when he gets to the end, if he's not there at the end, then he leaves it for the, for the other players. But if he is there at the end, he can accelerate through the gears and finish with a strike rate of 100 plus. So yeah, it's, he's just so solid. And that sort of thing is, is what makes a good one day batsman. I mean, you've got plenty of other players who play like that. Like you think of players like Joe Root, Kane Williamson, Steve Smith, the Fab Four, right? Who are so solid against all sorts of play, uh, all sorts of bowling that when it comes to pacing their innings in one day game, they just, it's just perfect for them, really. Absolutely. Um, and, I'm interested to know. Um, I'm just trying to get like the the highest scores up for the World Cup because we've had a lot of centurions. It's definitely been a batter's World Cup. Mm. Um, but what you said on pacing, I think, is so right. And when I read down this list of centurions, I think you're going to notice that every single uh, every single one is an anchor. Um, so. Devon Conway, David Milan, Mohamed Rizwan, Rohit Sharma, Ratchan Ravindra. I know slightly less about him, but I'm, I think he's a bit of an anchor. Um, Kusal Mendis, Abdullah Shafiq, Quinton de Kock, Rassi Van der uh, so oh, I can never say his name. Samarik Wawramamamama. <laughs> yep, I, I yep. nailed that. The Sri Lankan, <laughs> the Sri Lankan chap. Uh, yep. Aidan Markram, Virat Kohli, and then Quinton de Kock. Uh, <laughs> I'm having a good one. I guess Quinton, Quinton... Cock again, and then Kale Rahul got his 97 yeah. not out as well. So yeah, yeah, massive list of anchors, and they all do the same thing, which is pace their innings. They they get themselves in, so they're seeing the ball well, and they have that ability to go at a really high strike rate late in the innings if they need to, and that's such a it's so much more valuable in ODI because obviously the wicket, it is weird that in test matches, your wicket pretty much is always valuable. Uh, mm. Very, very few situations where your wicket is not a prized possession for a batter. In T20, it's pretty much not a prized possession for any batter. Um, maybe the occasional number three, you know, if you lose one early, you one down. Then for about a period of about seven overs, your wicket becomes a prized possession and then it's not anymore. Yeah. In ODIs, it is only for a select amount of time. Like for, for a for a good stretch of the innings, your wicket is a is a prized commodity and you need to look after it. And then mm. in the last like 10, 15 overs, depending on how many wickets you've got left, it then doesn't matter anymore. So you need to have that ability to protect your wicket and be kind of a bit selfish. And that's something that you will notice about those players. They they will play for their averages in a lot of situations, but mm. then they can abandon all of that and just absolutely go to town. So yeah, it is incredible. Definitely. I mean, if you're less than five down after the 30 over mark, then you're likely, you're likely to double your score at that stage. Um, and I think that shows wickets in hand is important. And the teams that are, we talk about losing more than, so many wickets in the power play of the 2020. If you lose more than five wickets in the first 20 overs of a one day match, you're struggling. Mm -hmm. And you look at the way England play, they're well, the way that England want to play, there is that slight concern that they could lose wickets quickly because they're going so much on the attack. I mean, the one exception in that list in terms of anchors is Quinton de Kock because he's not an anchor, he's the sort of player who wants to come out and attack the bowling from ball one. And I mean, when you look at other players from other teams, that's not really coming off as much. You think about Johnny Bairstow. He scored some big scores in one-day cricket in the past. He's not looking to defend it from ball one, um, and he's struggling. Jason Roy didn't make it into the England squad for this, but he's that other sort of player. Um, so in terms of England in that stage, it, it's it's not worked. Um, and it's the same for the other teams. Um they haven't really had that that sort of uh, player who can just attack from ball one and go for it. And Quinton de Kock, he's the he's just been the the exception. And maybe that is to do with the conditions in India. Maybe 
batting in a one day game in India is different to say batting in on a flat pitch in Pakistan. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It it probably is. Um but mm. having not batted in either yet, I'm sure no. I will one day. Um mm. but having not batted in either, I can't really say. Um the last thing that we want to say before we end this little kind of special extra podcast is who do we think is going to end this World Cup with the most centuries? Now, obviously, Quinton de Kock has already got two. So that that's uh, it's worth bearing in mind. Um, but yeah, what do you think? Um, I reckon someone like a Rohit Sharma mm-hmm. could easily end this World Cup with the most centuries. Um, he's just so good in World Cups and... In those Indian conditions, I can just see him getting quite a few. Um, I I can see Quinton de Kock getting another few more. <laughs> but yeah, my money's on Rohit Sharma, I think. He's going to get the most World Cup centuries. I think, yeah, I'm completely with you. I'd say those two are the ones I'm pinpointing out. Quinton de Kock is in magnificent form. And even mm. though I, I kind of see what you're saying and that he's not an anchor because he does like to attack early, I think... In T20s, he is a bit of an anchor in the same way that I would say Joss Butler is an anchor in T20s. Um, okay. Even though they go out with the high strike rates, they want to bat deep. Like they, you know, they, it's not like a Liam Livingston, for example, who once he started yeah. hitting sixes, he just doesn't want to stop. Mm-hmm. They will, they will tempo their innings just to, you know, accommodate which bowlers and that they're, they're a bit more, I don't know, intelligent about it. Um, yeah, not, not meant to be that big a slight on Liam Livingston, but that just kind of happened. Uh, but yeah, there we go. So, yeah, my, I, I think Quinton Cock is going to end with the most centuries. Let us know in the comments what you think. Um, I hope you like this little special. If you did, then let us know, leave a like, tell your friends about the channel. You can also uh, follow our social medias, all of it is in the link tree in the description. Become a member is awesome. You'll get a load of uh, cool emojis. I'm not going to point around the screen because that took too much editing last time, but they are there. Watch the last video if you want to see what cool emojis there are and cool badges that you can have next to your name in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you later. Goodbye.